Hello, everyone. I'm Billy. And I'm Comron. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors and the creators of the Malazan Brotherhood. Today, we will be discussing Book 4, Chapter 24, and the epilogue of Dead House Gates, a novel in the Malazan Books of the Fallen. This is the end of the book today. End of the book, man. Yeah. I will say that we're recording this on June 30th, and we released our first episode of Dead House Gates on June 29th of last year. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> So okay. everyone that spent a year of their lives <laughs> listening to us, thank you. Hey, thank y'all very much. We really appreciate y'all sticking along with us. Yeah. And then we'll have another year of memories of ice. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. At minimum, I'm a, it's yeah. a little bit longer, isn't it? We'll see. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it is most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Both Billy and I know it, this brother. will be the best fantasy story ever written and want to share our love of the series with you. We will be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that have not read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that respective book, but they were, again, at, we're at the end. There's not a whole lot I can really spoil at this point, but I'm going to work really hard to not spoil this last episode for y'all. There's not a lot you can spoil in this book. Yeah, I think we're, yeah. You have about 85% of the Malazan Book of the Fallen you could still technically spoil. Oh, that's just true. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it together, Billy. <laughs> Keep it together. What am I saying? <laughs> I'm equally at fault. Moving <laughs> along. A quick warning. Today's episode contains descriptions of extreme violence. Listener discretion is advised. Our show is listener supported. And if you'd like to support us, we would really appreciate that. And you can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad-free episodes on Patreon weekly. Also, we'd really like to hear from you. Send any feedback or comments to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. Last episode, I was trying to remember the scene where I had imagined a horse running off of some high up structure and into the water. Mm -hmm. And my mom reminded me that it's a scene from Braveheart after he kills the nobles and rides the horse out of the castle oh, and into the oh, lake. There you go. Yeah. Okay, right on. I was thinking it was in Jewel of the Nile for some reason. I have no idea why. I just have <laughs> a picture of somebody riding a horse off of some type of desert fort into the ocean. I don't know. Maybe I saw that at some point. Jewel Maybe it was a James Bond movie. I don't know. <laughs> Dude, yeah, a lot of my uh, – I've seen lots of things go over cliffs, waterfalls, and different things, but horses is not so frequently – like I said, it's the, the only one I had for reference until you brought that up is um, would they have done something similar and maybe Rob Roy? I can't remember. I've only seen that one once. Mm. Like I said, it, it was <laughs> The Adventures of Baron Munchausen by Terry Gilliam. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that was a really funny. It, it, it's it's a weird thing, man. It's, it's a Terry Gilliam movie. What do you want? <laughs> yeah, to be expected. All right. Chapter 24. The whirlwind spinning tunnel opened out onto the plane in an explosion of airborne dust. Shaikh led her train forward. After a moment, she slowed her mount. What she had first thought to be humped stones stretching out in all directions, she now realized were corpses rotting under the sun. They had come upon a battlefield, one of the last engagements between Corbolo Dom and Coltane. The grasses were black with dried blood. Cape moths fluttered here and there across the scene. Flies buzzed the heat-swollen bodies. The stench was overpowering. Beside her, Hebrick said, souls in tatters. She glanced at him, then gestured Leoman forward to her other side. She said, take a scouring party, see what lies ahead. Hebrick shivered and said, death lies ahead. Leoman grunted, we are already in its midst. Hebrick said, no, this, this is nothing. Corbolo Dom, what has he done? Shaikh snapped, we shall discover that soon enough. She waved Leoman and his troop forward. The army of the apocalypse marched out from the whirlwind warren. Shaikh had attached each of her three mages to a battalion. She preferred them apart and distanced from her. They had been none too pleased by the order of march, and she now sensed the three sorcerers questing ahead with enhanced sensitivities. Questing, then flinching back. Laoric first, then Bidithal, and finally Febril. From three sources came echoes of appalled horror. Shaikh thought, and should I choose it, I could do the same. Reach ahead with unseen fingers to touch what lies before us. Yet she would not. Hebrick murmured, There is trepidation in you, lass. Do you now finally regret the choices you have made? She thought, Regret? Oh yes, many regrets. 
beginning with a vicious argument with my sister back in Unta, a sisterly spat that went too far, a hurt child accusing her sister of killing their parents, one then the other, father, mother, a hurt child who had lost all reasons to smile. And that's an interesting bit of backstory there. I think this is the first time we have heard that their parents are dead. The last thing I remember was Gano is discussing their parents with Tavora when he went home in the prologue of Gardens of the Moon. Quick question I hadn't thought of until just now. How long do you think this book has taken in place in their time? Has it been a year as well? That would be kind of funny if we've covered this in a year in real time. <laughs> <laughs> through, through the whole thing you know but I, I at the beginning a year ago in that hateful prologue it was it hinted at in the prologue oh when she was there with uh oh my good gracious i can't think of his name right now but you know i'm talking about biden mm. and the heverick it was it there hinted at or mentioned that she has had to sacrifice her family with the rest of the nobles yeah it's like alluded to in a way that's like okay something's happened but i'm not sure what her parents fate is kind of hinted at i feel like in that prologue when they're being force marched through with, through that part you're right that during the prologue i had forgotten about this felicin had a thought when she sees tavora she is talking about the sacrifice tavora had to make to prove her loyalty and she had to choose between felicin and her mother on who would be killed immediately and yep. tavora choose the mother and it's implied that the father's already dead when this happens. Okay. And then Felicin ends up in the culling line anyway. <laughs> yes. That's such a brutal, that's like the hardest start of it. There's not a, there's not a harder Stephen King book. I mean, I've read a lot of Stephen King and it's hard stuff and I love Stephen King, but that's one of the hardest things I've ever read is that prologue. Right. <laughs> prologue to Deadhouse is rough, dude. It is rough. It's like NC-17 kind of rough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shaikh said, I have a daughter now. She sensed Hebrick's attention suddenly focusing on her, the old man wondering at this strange turn of thought, wondering, then slowly, in anguish, coming to understand. Shaikh went on, and I have named her. Hebrick said, I've yet to hear it, as if each word edged forward on thinnest ice. She nodded. Leoman and his scouts had disappeared beyond the next rise. A faint haze of smoke awaited them there, and she wondered at the portent. Shaikh said, she rarely speaks, yet when she does, a gift with words, Hebrick, a poet's eye, in some ways as I might have become, given the freedom. Hebrick said, a gift with words, you say, a gift for you, but it may well be a curse for her, one that has little to do with freedom. Some people invite all, whether they like it or not. Such people come to be very lonely, lonely in themselves, Shaikh. Leoman reappeared, reigning in on the crest. He watched as Shaikh guided her army forward. A moment later, another party of riders arrived at Leoman's side. Tribal standards on display. Strangers. Two of the newcomers drew Shaikh's attention. They were still too distant to make out their features, but she knew them anyway. Camist Rello and Corbolo Dom. She addressed Hebrick. She will not be lonely. Hebrick said, then feel no awe. Her inclination will be to observe rather than participate. Mystery lends itself to such remoteness. Shaikh said, I can feel no awe, Hebrick. They approached the waiting riders. Hebrick's attention stayed on her as they guided their horses up the gentle slope. She went on, and I understand remoteness quite well. Hebrick said, you have named her Felicin, haven't you? Shaikh said, I have. It's a fine name, is it not? It holds such promise, a fresh innocence, such as that which parents would see in their child, those bright, eager eyes. Hebrick said, I wouldn't know. She watched the tears roll down his cheeks, feeling detached from their significance yet understanding that his observation was not meant as a condemnation. She thought, only loss. She said, oh, Hebrick, it's not worthy of grief. Had she thought a moment longer before speaking those words, she would have realized that they, beyond any others, would break him. He seemed to crumple inward before her eyes, his body shuddering. She reached out a hand he could not see, almost touched him, then withdrew it, and even as she did so, she knew that a moment of healing had been lost. She thought, regrets? Many. Unending. They heard chemist Rello shout, Shaikh, I see the goddess in your eyes. His face was bright, even as it seemed twisted with tension. Ignoring him, Shaikh fixed her gaze on Corbolo Dom. She thought, half nappin. He reminds me of my old tutor, even down to the cool disdain in his expression. Well, this man has nothing to teach me. Clustered around the two men were the war leaders of the various tribes loyal to the cause. There was something like shock in their faces. 
intimations of horror. Another rider was now visible, seated with equanimity on a mule, wearing the silken robes of a priest. He alone seemed untroubled, and Shaikh felt a shiver of unease. It's interesting that Malik Rel now rides a mule. When he rode with Pormqual, he sat atop a horse. Mm -hmm. He certainly plays the crowd, doesn't he? Oh, yes, he does. He is an oily, slick little thing. <laughs> <laughs> Slippery like an eel. Yes, very much so. <laughs> Leoman sat his horse slightly apart from the group. Shaikh already sensed a dark turmoil swirling between Leoman and Corbolo Dom. With Hebrick at her side, she reached the crest and saw what lay beyond. In the immediate foreground was a ruined village, a scattering of smoldering houses and buildings, dead horses, dead soldiers. The stone-built entrance to the Aran Way was blackened with smoke. The road stretched away in an even declination southward. She noted something in the trees to either side. Shaikh nudged her horse forward. Hebrick matched her, silent and hunched, shivering in the heat. Leoman rode to flank her on the other side. They approached the Aran Gate. The group wheeled to follow in silence. Chemist Rello spoke, the faintest quaver in his voice. See what has been made of this proud gate. The Malazan Empire's Aaron Gate is now Hood's Gate, Seer. Do you see the significance? Do you? Corbolo Dom growled, Silence! Saik <laughs> thought, Aye, silence. Let silence tell this tale. Now, I know this is a serious scene. Mm -hmm. But I have to mention the most epic growl of the word silence ever recorded. <laughs> Do you remember the scene in Kingdom of Heaven where Jeremy Irons growled silence when the court in Jerusalem was arguing over whether to go to attack Saladin? No, I did not. But I did watch the link you showed me. And yes, I think that is the most epic <laughs> growl okay. of silence that I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> there must be war. God wills it! <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's dude. great. It's such a it's, good delivery. Yeah, it is. It's beautiful. I love yeah. I mean, I'm a fan of Jeremy Irons, anyhow. So please. he did good in that role. Yeah, I, I need to watch that. There's a bunch of stuff I've been needing to watch. Been watching other things. I didn't know this until recently, but apparently the king, I think it was Baldwin, it was his name in that movie, the guy that had leprosy and was wearing that mask, uh -huh. that was based on real life events, the fact that he had leprosy and wore that mask like that. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. It's kind of interesting because there's a couple of folks that are mentioned in the Bible, actually, that are his, you know, historical characters as far as I'm concerned, that one was a, he was a Syrian in the old testament times and he was a leper and the other groups did not see the lepers necessarily as to be outcast as so much as like the jewish people did because that was to keep them safe in all honesty this man was seen um i can't think of the guy's name at the moment but such a great warrior that he was very well respected and he actually got healed but i'm kind of reminded of the times and saying that the fact that that's that the leper is very interesting. I saw that guy wearing a mask and was curious as to what was going on there and thought, I wonder if he's a leper. Mm -hmm, I mean, he is. Yeah. And, and I know that Kingdom of Heaven is based in truth. It's about the crusade. So it is for that fact alone. They passed beneath the gate's cool shadow and came to the first of the trees, the first of the bloated, rotting bodies nailed to them. Shaikh halted. Leoman's scouts were approaching at a fast canter. Moments later, they arrived, reined in. Leoman snapped, report. Four pale faces regarded them. Then one said, It does not change, sir. More than three leagues, as far as we could see. There are, there are thousands. For these individuals to react this way tells me a lot about the bloodthirstiness of the forces that emerged from the portal compared to those that hounded Coltane on the chain of dogs. Yeah. Those that hadn't dealt with the frustration of the Wiccans thwarting them at every turn, they don't have that bloodthirstiness, it seems. And they're truly appalled by what they're seeing here, what Corbolo Dom has done. Yeah. You know, it's kind of funny. It's a different reaction than what I was expecting here. You know, I thought they'd be like, all right, right on. Good job. Yeah. yeah. Some kind of a zealous, <laughs> yeah. God wills it type of thing, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's like, wow. It's like, you know, you can't carry that a bit far, did you? <laughs> yeah. I've been carried away with that. Yeah, I was truly surprised by their reaction. And it says a lot about them. Yes, it does. Hebrick pulled his horse to one side, nudged it closer to the nearest tree, and squinted up at the closest corpse. Shaikh was silent for a long minute. Then, without turning, she said, Where is your army, Corbolo Dom? 
Corbolo said, camped within sight of the city. Shaikh said, you failed to take Aaron then. Corbolo said, I seer, we failed. Shaikh asked, an adjunct to Vora? Corbolo said, the fleet has reached the bay, seer. The reckoning has arrived. Yes, yes, yes. The empire will answer in kind. <laughs> yes, it will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's like here we go. I, I immediately, I, I'm sensing Vader on that one. It's like here's Vader <laughs> pulling up into into the bay. All of a sudden, it's like oh. <laughs> I was thinking about Lacine's response last week. Mm -hmm. Shaikh thought, "What will you make of this, sister?" Corbolo said, "The fool surrendered at High Fist Pormqual's command, and that is the Empire's new weakness. What used to be a strength." Those soldiers obeyed the command. The Empire has lost its great leaders. She finally turned to him and asked, Has it now? Corbolo said, Coltane was the last of them, seer. This new adjunct is untested. A nobleborn, for Hood's sake. Who awaits her in Aaron? Who will advise her? The seventh is gone. Pormqual's army is gone. Tavora has an army of recruits, about to face veteran forces three times their number. The Empress has lost her mind, seer, to think that this pure blood upstart will reconquer seven cities. She turned away from him and stared down the Aaron Way. She said, Withdraw your army, Corbolo Dom. Link up with my forces here. Corbolo said, Seer? Shaikh said, The apocalypse has but one commander, Corbolo Dom. Do as I say. She then thought, and silence once again tells its tale. After a moment of silence, Corbolo grated, Of course, Seer. <laughs> Shaikh said, Leoman. Leoman said, Seer? Shaikh said, Encamp our own people. Have them bury the dead on the plain. Corbolo cleared his throat and said, and once we've regrouped, what do you propose to do then? She thought, propose? She then said, we shall meet Tavora, but the time and place shall be of my choosing, not hers. She paused and said, we return to Raraku. You will pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, is that, is that what you young and said? Or you will pay for that. Yes, for yes. That. Okay, yes. sorry. No, you got it right. You got okay, it right. Wait, that's buried yeah. in me. I'll do that. That's, that's... <laughs> I wish I had it recorded. Ugh. It's too funny. <laughs> Shaikh ignored the shouts of surprise and dismay, ignored the questions flung at her, even as they rose into demands. She thought, Raraku, the heart of my newfound power, I shall need that embrace if I am to defeat this fear, this terror of my sister. Oh, goddess, guide me now. Those experiences and feelings are deep in her psyche. And that's a difficult task to overcome those formative experiences, especially doing so on your own with no support or guidance. Yeah, that's tough because we got to remember what she's 13, 14, 15, maybe 15. I think she might be 16 now. Okay. Maybe 15 16. or 16, I think. So, yeah, she's a kid. This is just really heavy. I mean, very heavy stuff to weigh up on her. I can't imagine what this is like. And all of a sudden, she's got this power, too. So, it's. Very interesting. One final point on this is she doesn't even have anybody she can confide in yeah. in regards to this topic. Yeah, absolutely not. Hebrick is the only one that knows that Tavora is her sister. Yes. I don't think she feels that she can have that type of relationship where she can talk about this type of subject matter with him. Yeah, that's a very personal and especially being hurt so much as a youngster or if real or imagined these hurts are you know however that real or imagined they are uh, yeah she is truly on her own and, and it does create some sympathy for her she's finally kind of got to this part where it's like you know this person i didn't care for i now kind of you know it's like i do have some empathy for her. yeah the protests eliciting no responses slowly died away a wind had picked up moaned through the gate behind them Hebrick's voice rose above it. Who is this? I can see nothing, can sense nothing. Who is this man? The corpulent, silk-clad priest finally spoke. An old man unhanded one. A soldier, no more than that. One among ten thousand. So, Hebrick is looking up at Duiker, I take it. That's my guess. He was the last one, and this is the farthest point. Yeah, and also with the weird absence that he can't see is also some kind of confirmation for that, too. Oh, right, because he probably sees all the other people, but yeah. the fact that he doesn't see, yeah, good catch there. Yeah. So something he can't sense. So Hebrick slowly turned as he said, do, do you, do you hear a God's laughter? Does anyone hear a God's laughter? Hmm. The gistal priest cocked his head and said, alas, I hear only the wind. Shaikh frowned at Hebrick. He looked suddenly so small. After a moment, she wheeled her horse around and said, it is time to leave. You have your orders. Uh, something that just came up to me here and I had not. So 
the thing around Duiker's neck was that Shadow Thrones? Mm, no, because it was just something that the you know the Trigalis showed up with that stuff and said, "Hey, somebody." Uh, Quick Ben you know, made it for him. Yeah, but that don't mean it wasn't made with something. You know, I don't. I mean, I, or was it Ben? I don't know, man. Ben is shadow. Even then, Ben has access to multiple Warrens. We don't know which one he used to make it. Yeah, maybe he okay. wove three of them together to do it. We yeah, don't know. That crazy man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> that wonderful crazy man. <laughs> Hebrick was the last, sitting helpless on his horse, staring up at a corpse that told him nothing. There was no end to the laughter in his head, the laughter that rode the wind sweeping through Aaron Gate at his back. He thought, what am I not meant to see? Is it you who have truly blinded me now, Fainer? Or is it that stranger of jade who flows silent within me? Is this a cruel joke or some kind of mercy? See what has become of your wayward son, Fainer, and know, most assuredly know, that I wish to come home. I wish to come home. And that's quite the turn for Hebrick, who has spent the entire duration of this book denouncing Fainer. Yeah. Do you think he's seeking some type of comfort here? I think so. Maybe the laughter could be something, an intimation of something else. We go to Aaron. Commander Blistig stood at the parapet, watching the adjunct and her retinue ascend the broad limestone steps that led to the palace gate directly beneath him. She was not as old as he would have liked, but even at this distance, he sensed something of the rumored hardness in her. An attractive younger woman walked at her side. Tavora's aide and lover, it was said, but Blistig could not recall if he'd ever heard her name. We have. She was introduced during the prologue. Her name is Taamber. On the adjunct's other flank strode the captain of her family's own house guard, a man named Gimlet Gamut. What a name. <laughs> yeah. Or some such <laughs> thing. <laughs> Sounds like a big drink. <laughs> He had the look of a veteran, and that was reassuring. We also met Gamut when Ganoes returned home during the prologue of Gardens of the Moon. Yep. Captain Keneb arrived at Blistig's side and said, No luck, Commander. Blistig frowned, then sighed. The scorched ship's crew had disappeared almost immediately after docking and offloading the wounded soldiers from Coltane's 7th. So the Salonda finally made it to Aaron. That's some good news, at least. Yeah, about time we got some good news. Other, I mean, other than Tavora arriving is good news as well. But Well, that was expected, though. That's true. That is expected. We didn't know. Yeah, you were wondering, because I think it was last episode, even you had mentioned, well, I wonder where the Salonda is. Yeah, why it took him so long to get there. Yeah. The garrison commander had wanted the crew of the ship present for the adjunct's arrival. He suspected Tavora would desire to question them. He thought, and who knows, those irreverent bastards could do with a blistering. <laughs> <laughs> and I bet he loved Gessler's attitude. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Reverend son of a gun there. Oh, my word. Yeah. Oh, I love those guys. I just love those guys, man. Mm -hmm. and they're Marines, too, aren't they? They're coastal they are. Marines. Yes. But, but they're still Marines. The Marines are Marine, right? It's just where they're Marines assigned. Marine. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Kenneb said, the seventh survivors have been assembled for her inspection, sir. Blistig asked, including the Wiccans? Keneb said, I, and both warlocks among them. Blistig shivered despite the sultry heat. He thought they were a frightening pair, so cold, so silent. Two children who are not. Squint was still missing. Blistig well knew that it was unlikely he would ever see that man again. Heroism and murder in a single gesture would be a hard thing for any person to live with. He only hoped that they wouldn't find the old bowman floating face down in the harbor. Imagine the guilt he must be feeling. I feel so bad for him. Oh, I know I do too. I feel really bad for Squid. But can we just admit for a moment that that shot was amazing? <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. You have to wonder if there was some intervention involved as well. Yeah, I'm guessing there was something there. But at the same time, they knew to call for this fellow. Yes. Keneb cleared his throat and said, those survivors, sir. Blistig said, I know, Keneb, I know. He thought, they're broken. Queen's mercy so broken. Mended flesh can only do so much. Mind you, I've got my own troubles with the garrison. I've never seen a company so brittle. <laughs> Keneb said, we should make our way below, sir. She's almost at the gate. Ballistic sighed, aye, let's go meet this adjunct Tavora. We go to Mapo and Icarium. Mapo gently laid Icarium down in the soft sand of the sinkhole. He'd rigged a tarp over Icarium, sufficient for shade, but there was little he could do about the stench of putrefaction that hung heavy in the motionless air. It was not the best of smells for the jag to awaken to. The ruined village was behind them now, the Black Gate's shadow unable to reach to where Mapo had laid out the camp beside the road and its ghastly sentinels. The Azath Warren had spat them out ten leagues to the north, days ago now. Mapo had carried Icarium in his arms all that way, seeking a place free of death. 
He'd hoped to have found it by now. Instead, the horror had worsened. What a nasty environment to end up in. Days of nothing but rotting corpses. It's the stuff of nightmares. Oh, dude, straight out of the nightmare. That's awful. Just thought of this. Carrying Ikarium that whole time, Ikarium's yeah. nearly seven feet tall. I assume he weighs quite a bit. Yeah, but also, uh, we've you know, I keep forgetting how big of a fellow the trail are. You know, they're like trolls. So, you know, they're pretty big fellows themselves. Yeah. I'm not saying that this is still not easy, but yeah, to, to carry in this long through this stuff is just like man yeah <laughs> it's just like hmm. he's just some willpower <laughs> yeah mappo strained at the sound of wagon wheels clattering on the road he squinted against the glare a lone ox pulled a flatbed cart up Aaron way a man sat hunched on the buckboard seat and there was motion behind him two more men crouched down on the bed bent to some unseen task their progress was slow as the driver stopped the cart at every tree the man spending a minute or so staring up at the bodies nailed to it before moving on to the next one. Picking up his sack, Mappo made his way toward them. On seeing him, the driver drew the cart to a halt and set the brake. He casually reached over the back of the seat and lifted into view a massive flint sword, which he settled sideways across his thighs. Stormy appears. Yes. <laughs> That's that one that the Talani mask gave him, that sword. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, he's got, I love it. Those blades are... Those are awesome blades. Mm -hmm. That's the Talani mask that may or may not have sacrificed himself to seal the <laughs> right. rent. He's either quite the martyr or he's quite the villain. Like the shyster, yeah. Stormy growled, if you mean trouble, Trell, back away now or you'll regret it. The other two men straightened up at this, both armed with crossbows. Mappo set down his sack and held out both hands. All three men were strangely hewed, and Mappo sensed a latent power in them that made him uneasy. He said, the very opposite of trouble, I assure you. For days now, I've walked among the dead. You're the first living people I've seen in that time. Seeing you has been a relief, for I had feared I was lost in one of Hood's nightmares. Stormy said, I'd say you are at that. He set his sword down, twisted around, and said, reckon it's all right, Corporal. Besides, maybe he has some bandages we can barter from him or something. The older of the two men on the flatbed swung down to the ground and approached Mappo. Mappo said, you have injured soldiers? I have some skill in healing. Gessler's smile was taut, pained. He said, I doubt you'd want to waste your skills. We ain't got hurt people in the wagon. We got a pair of dogs. Mappo asked, dogs? Gessler said, I. Dags. <laughs> Gessler said, I. We found them at the fall. Seems Hood didn't want them. Not right away, anyway. Personally, I can't figure out why they're still alive. They're so full of holes and chopped up. He shook his head. I can't believe anything could have survived what these dogs have gone through. The amount of time it's been since the atrocity has been considerable. That's a lot of time to be dying and in pain. <laughs> I know it's just awful, dude. But man, what a tough beast! And I'm not, and I mean and that also <laughs> that also include the little one, right? That yes. Include Roach. Yeah. So it's like Roach is just that tough too. It's like that gum. It stepped up into the role of it, it, it thinks it's a Wiccan cattle dog, so it can't do any less than the other Wiccan cattle dogs around it, so it can't die yet. Yeah. Wow. Stormy had climbed down as well and was making his way up to the end of the road, studying each and every corpse before moving on. Mappo gestured the driver's way and said, you're looking for someone. Gessler nodded and said, we are, but the bodies are pretty far gone. It's kind of hard to tell for sure. Still, Stormy says he'll know him when he sees him, if he's here. Mappo's gaze flicked from the corporal traveled down Aaron Way. He asked, how far does this go? Gessler said, the whole way, Trell. 10,000 soldiers, give or take. Hmm. Mappo said, and you've... Gessler said, we've checked them all. His eyes narrowed, then he said, well, Stormy's up to the last few anyway. You know, even if we wasn't looking for someone particular, well, at the very least, he shrugged. Mappo looked away, his own face tightening. He said, your friend mentioned something called the fall. What is that? Gessler said, the place where Coltane and the Seventh went down. The dogs were the only survivors. Coltane guided 30,000 refugees from Hisar to Aaron. It was impossible, but that's what he did. He saved those ungrateful bastards, and his reward was to get butchered not 500 paces from the city's gate. No one helped him, Trell. Mm. Gessler's eyes searched Mappos. He asked, can you imagine that? These guys have seen a lifetime of war, and they are still disturbed by the conclusion of the chain of dogs. Well, think about this. I mean, especially just think of how wrong it is that the, how many thousands of leagues was it? I can't even remember. 
it's like what three or six thousand leagues or some ridiculous distance that he drugged these people over and survived while losing all his forces and kept most of them alive and to get them there and then to die because they won't open the gate and send anyone to, to drive you know not even a couple football fields distance to go help them out is really aggravating <laughs> I still get pretty, I, I get pro my legs. I get pretty pissed off about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and going back to those survivors that came in on the boat, imagine the survivor's guilt. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Especially the Wiccans. Oh. The Wiccan sorcerers in particular. The Wiccans have a really such a tribal identity almost that not being with these folks when they were being killed has just got to be dreadful on these folks and on these youngins in particular. Another question here that's just popped in my head. So, with Quick Ben arranging that vial. So did he make the arrangements with Gessler and Stormy and Truth? To, why would they be looking for them out here? I don't even know that they know about the vial. Okay, but why would they be looking? Who are they? I mean, they're looking for the one guy. I mean, it's like they're looking for one guy. They're supposed to be looking for, they may not know about the vial, but they know about one guy they're looking for. Who commissioned these guys? They're to come probably out here looking for, for Duraker to see if he's with them. That's what I'm thinking. That it's impossible for them to know about the vial because they weren't there when the Trigal no, Trade Guild showed up, were no, they? No I, know, I, no, I don't believe they were. Mm -hmm. I can't remember because they were all together at one point off the Trigal necessarily, but the these three, the Stormy, the, the Salanda crew was there with the Coltane and Duaker bunch at one point. Mm-hmm. And, that was and a, to meet it for Vathar, that cross. Yeah, they didn't show up till later. So yeah, no, they wouldn't have known about that at all. So I get never mind. They were just looking for Duiker for personal curiosity. Is that what it is? You think? I think so because they had yeah. Duiker and them went way back to the beginning of the first time we met them was when Duiker was in their town with Culp. Yeah, that's true. Culp. Yeah, another great, great character lost. R.I.P. Okay. Mappo said, "I am afraid I know nothing of the events you describe." Gessler said, so I guessed. Hood knows where you've been hiding lately. Mappo nodded. After a moment, he sighed. I'll take a look at your dogs, if you like. Gessler said, all right, but we don't hold out much hope. Thing is, the lad's gone and taken to him, if you know what I mean. Mappo walked to the cart and clambered aboard. He found the lad hunched down over a mass of red, torn flesh and bone, feebly waving flies from the flesh. Mappo whispered, Hood's mercy, as he studied what had once been a cattle dog. He asked, where's the other one? Truth pulled back a piece of cloth, revealing a lapdog of some kind. All four legs had been deliberately broken. Pus crusted the brakes, and the creature shook with fever. God. Yeah, I mean... Hey, the little one to be alive after the leg breaking stuff is unbelievable for so long. The big one got speared, and it ripped yeah. out the guy's throat when it was <laughs> go on its way down. Yeah. So it's been fully impaled and it's still somehow alive. Yeah, missed all the organs, I'm guessing. and But, oh, but the dog, but the small one, that's the real testament for mm -hmm. whatever i'm not sure but something truth said that little one it was left lying on this one his tone was filled with pain and bewilderment mappo said neither one will make it lad that big one should have died long ago it may well be dead now truth said no no he's alive i can feel his heart but it's slowing it's slowing and we can't do nothing gessler said we should help it along that's slowing we should end its pain but maybe maybe Mappo watched the lad fuss over the hapless creatures, his long-fingered, almost delicate hands daubing the wounds with a blood-soaked piece of cloth. After a moment, Mappo straightened, slowly turning to stare down the long road. He heard a shout behind them, close to the gate, then heard Gessler running to join Stormy. Mappo thought, Ah, Ikarium, soon you will awaken, and still I shall grieve, and so lead you to wonder. My grief begins with you, friend, for your loss of memories. Memories not of horror, but of gifts given so freely. Too many dead. How to answer this? How would you answer this, Ikarium? He stared for a long time down Aaron Way. Behind him, Truth crouched over the cattle dog's body, while the crunch of boots approached slowly from up the road. The cart pitched as Stormy clambered up to take his seat. Gessler swung himself into the flatbed, expressionless. Truth looked up and said, You find him, Gessler? Did Stormy find him? Gessler said no. Thought for a minute, but no. He ain't here, lad. Time to head back to Aaron. Truth said, Queen's blessing. Then there's always a chance. Gessler said, Aye. Who can say, Truth? Who can say? Truth returned his attention to the cattle dog. Mappo slowly turned, met Gessler's eyes, and saw the lie writ plain. Mappo nodded. Gessler said, Thanks for taking a look at the dogs anyway. I know they're finished. I guess we wanted, well, we would have liked. His voice fell away. Then he shrugged and asked, Want to ride back to Aaron? Mappo shook his head and climbed down to stand at the roadside. 
He said, Thank you for the offer, Corporal. My kind aren't welcome in Aaron, so I'll pass. Gessler said, As you like. Mappa watched them turn the cart around. He thought, How would you answer this? They were thirty paces down the road when Mappo shouted. They halted, Gessler and Truth straightening to watch as Mappo jogged forward, rummaging in his pack as he did so. Watching Truth fuss over these dogs and Gessler and Mappo looking at each other knowing there's nothing they can do to help them, it's such a heart-wrenching scene. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it really gets you. Especially because, I mean, well, it's, we're getting to the end of the book. We have time to process the loss. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. And I found Mappo's reaction interesting as well, thinking, what would Ikarium do? Yeah. And it, it shows how highly he thinks of Ikarium and his compassion. Yeah, it does. It really does. It, what's funny, we have good reason. Multiple times we've seen the compassion. Everyone, Fiddler, all of these people, everyone has bled for Ikarium because he's so sweet to everybody. You know, he's real sweet until he gets pushed over the edge. And then we knock him out and you wake him up, he gets sweet again. <laughs> mm -hmm. We go to Iskrol Pust, who padded down a rock-strewn, dusty path. He paused to scratch vigorously beneath his tattered robes. First one place, then another, then another. A moment later, he shrieked and began tearing at his clothes. Spiders, hundreds of them, <laughs> spinning away, falling to the ground, scattering into cracks and crevices as he thrashed about. Iskrol screamed, I knew it! I knew it! Show yourself! I dare you! The spiders reappeared, racing over the sun-baked ground. Gasping, Puss staggered back, watched as the diver assembled into human form. He found himself facing a wiry, black-haired woman. Though she was an inch shorter than him, her frame and features bore a startling resemblance to his own. Puss scowled. Great, now there are two of them. <laughs> it's, oh, man. That's a horrific thought. <laughs> <laughs> He said, you thought you had me fooled? You thought I didn't know you were lurking about? The woman sneered. I did have you fooled. Oh, how you hunted, thick-skulled idiot. Just like every Dalhanese man I've ever met. A thick-skulled idiot, Puss said. Only a Dalhanese woman would say that. She shouted, aye, and who would know better? Puss said, what is your name, divers? She said, Mogora, and I've been with you for months. Months! I saw you lay the false trail. I saw you painting those hand and paw marks on the rocks. I saw you move that stone to the forest's edge. <laughs> My kin may be idiots, but I am not. Puss shrieked, you'll never get to the real gate, never. Magura shouted, I don't want to. His eyes narrowed on her sharp featured face. He began circling her. He crooned, indeed, and why is that? Twisting to keep him in front of her, she crossed her arms and regarded him down the length of her nose as she said, I escaped Dalhan to be rid of idiots. Why would I become ascendant just to rule over other idiots? Puss said, You are a true Dalhanese hag, aren't you? Spiteful, condescending, a sneering bitch in every way. <laughs> Magora said, And you are Dalhanese oaf, conniving, untrustworthy, shifty. Puss shouted, Those are all words for the same thing. She shouted, And I have plenty more. Puss said, Let's hear them then. They began down the trail, Magora resuming her litany, lying, deceitful, thieving, shifty. Puss said, you said that one already. Magora said, so what? Shifty, slimy, slippery. And the evenings must just fly by. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine how taxing it would be to have to hear oh. them bickering constantly? Oh, my word. The fact that they're so identical, I mean, that's, I'm assuming that's just the Dalhan as a whole, or just cantankerous folks to put it mildly the emperor's dalhanese yes we get a little bit of this from him yeah but what's funny is like think of the power it's like the, the fact that all this stuff that pust has done everyone was commenting you know it's like well this doesn't look like he could have done this it's just like it looks like it's been here forever so he, <laughs> he's good let's mm -hmm. face it he's powerful we know he's powerful but we don't really see it but he's obviously what he's been doing is requires a lot of skill and a lot of power right and he is both even though he comes across as a complete and utter idiot and a madman. <laughs> I've never thought he's an idiot. I'll put it like this. He comes across as foolish, but not an idiot, mm -hmm. if that's possible. I don't know. It's one or the other. He's, it's different. He's a, he's a conundrum. <laughs> that may be the shadow thing also. I'm not sure. Right. On a nearby summit, an enormous undead dragon rose silently from its perch, wings spreading to glow with the sun's light, even as the membrane dimmed the color that reached through. Black, flat eyes glanced down at the two figures scrambling toward the cliff face. The attention was momentary. Then an ancient warren opened before the soaring creature, swallowed it whole, then vanished. Iskrol Pust and Magora stared at the spot in the sky for a moment longer. A half-grin twitched on Pust's features. He said, ah, you weren't fooled, were you? You came here to guard the true gate, 
ever mindful of your duties, you Talani mass. You bone casters with your secrets that drive me mad. Magora muttered, you were born mad. Ignoring her, he continued addressing the now vanished dragon. Well, the crisis is past, isn't it? Could you have held against all those children of yours? Not without Iskrol Pust. Oh no, not without me. Magora barked a contemptuous laugh. He threw her a glare, then scampered ahead. That statement there, could you have held against all those children of yours? I find that interesting. This almost makes it sound like the Talani Mass was responsible for the creation of the soul taken in divers. Is Was that covered? They did talk about them fighting with the first Empire people right? that were in the midst of the transformation, but the initial creation of them? Yeah, the initial creation, man, I'm curious. They might... I, I... For some reason, that rings true to me. I don't know why. I don't know. I can't. I don't. I can't hang my hat on that for any reason. But yeah, that, that makes me think that they might possibly be. Yeah. I also imagine this dragon to be the same one that Culp followed out of the nascent on the Salanda. Would you agree? It was an undead dragon, yeah. and yeah. he followed it through the Warren of Talon. That's why Stormy and Gesler and Truth look like they're annealed because they went through Talon after this dragon. Yeah. The linkages have always floored me. Like I said, that's one of those things that become more apparent. Now, some other readers more skilled than I may have been put this stuff together quicker than I did, but it took multiple reads for me to find these linkages and I still am kind of, but I'm like you, I think this is, I think it's what you're seeing here. I think it's the same dragon. Stopping beneath the lone gaping window high in the cliff tower, Puss screamed, I'm home, I'm home. The words echoed forlornly, then faded. Puss began dancing in place, too agitated to remain still. And he kept dancing as a minute passed, then another. Magora watched him, one eyebrow raised. Finally, a small brown head emerged from the window and peered down. The bared fangs might have been a smile, but Puss could not be sure of that. He could never be sure of that. Magora muttered, oh, look, one of your fawning worshippers. Puss said, aren't you funny? Magora said, what I am is hungry. Who's going to prepare meals now that servant's gone? Puss said, you are, of course. She flew into a spitting rage. Puss watched her antics with a small smile on his face. He thought, ah, glad to see I've not lost my charm. Yeah. <laughs> that constant bickering. Yeah. They deserve each other. Yeah. The true phrase I was looking for was like, and the long winter nights must just fly by. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh. We go somewhere else. The enormous ornate wagon stood in a cloud of dust well away from the road. The horses, slow to lose their terror, stamping, tossing their heads. Two knee-high creatures scampered from the wagon and padded on bandy legs toward the road, their long arms held out to the sides. Outwardly, they resembled Bacarala, their small, wizened faces corkscrewing as they squinted in the harsh sunlight. Yet they were speaking Daru. I wonder what kind of demons these are. Are they like Moby? You know, like Moby's young is the impression I get in particular for some reason. And maybe he'll get to be something like this and more and more intelligent as he gets considerably older because maybe these things are pretty long lived. Oh, so that's a good point. Maybe it, they're just the same types of demons as Moby because Moby looked like a Baccarella. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Maybe they are like him. He's like them. But these are speaking Daru. Moby didn't speak Daru. No, he didn't speak anything that we know of. But maybe he's just, maybe it's because he's young, though. We don't know how long Baruch, was it Baruch was his uncle? No, no, Baruch, no. Uh, Mammoth was the Mam uncle. Mammoth, Mammoth. Um, you know, it was Mammoth's familiar, but we don't know how long he'd had him. I'm assuming for quite some time, but maybe these things just take some time mm. to learn things. Yeah. Makes you wonder about Mammoth, doesn't it? Yeah. What did Mammoth know? <laughs> mm-hmm. He was dressed. He was. He was Earth. So I mean, he might have been well aware of what the Azath were, and maybe he's aware. Of, maybe these things serve the Azath. Mm, I don't know. That seems a big leap. <laughs> it is. It is. I, I, I agree. The shorter of the pair said, "Are you sure?" The other snarled in frustration. "I'm the one who's linked, right? Not you, Erp. Not you. Baruch would never be such a fool as to task you with anything except grunt work." Erp said, "You got that right, Rud." Grunt work. I'm good at that, ain't I? Grunt work. Grunt, grunt, grunt. You sure about this? Really sure? They made their way up the bank and approached the last tree lining the road. Both creatures squatted down before it, staring up in silence at the withered corpse nailed to the bowl. Erp muttered, I don't see nothing. I think you're wrong. I think you've lost it, Rudd, and you won't admit it. I think, <laughs> Rudd said, I'm one word away from killing you, Erp. I swear it. <laughs> <laughs> Herb said, fine, I die good, you know. 
Grunt, gasp, grunt, sigh, grunt. <laughs> Rudd ambled to the tree's base, the few stiff hairs of his hackles the only sign of his simmering temper. He clambered upward, pulled himself onto the chest of the corpse, and rummaged with one hand beneath the rotted shirt. He plucked loose a tattered, soiled piece of cloth, unfolding it. He frowned. Earp's voice rose from below. He asked, What is it? Rudd said, A name's written on here. Earp asked, Whose? Rudd shrugged and said, Sailus Lorthal. So we finally find out what was written on the cloth that the nameless Marine handed Duerker. Mm, wow. It breaks your heart that that's all that's written on there. Just mm -hmm. her name. Yeah. And the fact that Erickson inserts this detail in the middle of this comical segment can take the edge off of it unless you sit and think about the tragedy of the situation. Yeah. It's easy yeah. to just kind of gloss over it mm -hmm. with the humor going on in the background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really kind of, it does make you really stop and think. It's just like, wow. And because it, it answers the question that we've been asking the whole book and that, we, you know, it's not primarily in our thoughts, but there's, there's some times when she's really stepped up and we're like, who is this woman? And we're wondering what she said to him. And she didn't need to say anything to him other than his name, than her name, because they never exchanged names. Yeah, I thought it could have been something more mm -hmm. than they shared between them. But the fact that it's just her name seems to make it more serious to me. Yes, in, in it does. Way. Yeah, way more. It makes it real poignant. Well, it's yeah. really like, well, and it, that's part of the beauty of that moment is that this moment of kind of comedy is offset by this. Oh, that's right. What This is what led to this. We have to reflect on that. It's well done. Erp said, that's a woman's name. He's not a woman, is he? Rudd snapped, of course not. A moment later, he tucked the cloth back under the shirt. He muttered, mortals are strange, as he began searching beneath the shirt again. He quickly found what he sought and drew forth a small bottle of smoky glass. Erp demanded, well? With satisfaction, Rudd said, it broke all right. I can see the cracks. He leaned forward and bit through the thong, then, clutching the bottle in one hand, scrambled back down. Crouched at the base, he held the bottle to the sun and squinted through it. Erp grunted. Rudd then held the bottle against one pointed ear and shook it. He said, ah, he's in there all right. Erp said, good, <laughs> let's go. Rudd said, not yet. The body comes with us. Mortals are particular that way. He won't want another. So go get it, Erp. Erp squawked. There's nothing left of the damn thing. Rudd said, right, then it won't weigh much, will it? <laughs> Grumbling, Erp climbed the tree and began pulling out the spikes. Rudd listened to his grunts with satisfaction. Then he shivered and said, hurry up, damn you. It's eerie around here. Ikarium's eyes fluttered open and slowly focused on the wide, bestial face looking down on him. Puzzled recognition followed. He said, Mapo Trell, my friend. Mapo asked, how do you feel, Ikarium? He moved slightly and winced. He said, I, I'm injured. Mapo said, I, I'm afraid I gave away my last two elixirs and so could not properly heal you. Ikarium managed a smile. He said, I am certain, as always, that the need was great. Mapo said, you may not think so, I'm afraid. I saved the lives of two dogs. Ikarium's smile broadened. They must have been worthy beasts. I look forward to that tale. Help me up, please. Mapo asked, are you certain? Ikarium said, yes. So Mapo judged correctly that Ikarium would have given the two elixirs to heal the dogs. Nice. Well done, Mapo. That's pretty touching, too. It, is, makes it, it made me feel like, you're like, oh, wow, cool. He did it because truth was so attached to them. You think? Yeah. It's not the dogs, right? He wanted to help the Marines out. Yeah, he wanted to help the Marines out. And that's very touching with the fact that whether or not he knows what it does or he's going to, he know it'll help them dogs, I'm assuming. And whether it does or doesn't, it'll be up to the, to whatever. But uh, yeah, it makes it very touching. And he knows that a car will be all right anyhow. <laughs> He'll walk it off one way or the other. Yeah. He's done it for a couple hundred thousand years before he came around. So. Mm -hmm. Mapo supported Ikarium as he struggled to his feet. Ikarium tottered, then found his balance. He raised his head and looked around. He asked, where? Where are we? Mapo asked, what do you remember? Ikarium said, I, I remember nothing. No, wait. We'd sighted a demon, an Aptorian it was, and decided to follow it. Yes, that I recall. That. So he remembers nothing from the entire book. That's the first yeah. scene we saw them in. Yeah. Well, at least he knows Mapo. Sometimes in the book, he wouldn't say Mapo's name. He'd just call him friend a lot and friend. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> he knows he's a friend, but does he know who he is? <laughs> so at least here he's like Mapo Trail. Okay. Cool. So we got a good reset this time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
it's like, okay okay good he knows who i am this time good good that's a good start yeah <laughs> mapo said oh well we are far to the south now Icarium. cast out from a warren your head struck a rock and you lost consciousness following that aptorian was a mistake Icarium said evidently how how long mapo said a day Icarium, just a day Icarium had steadied visibly regaining strength until mapo felt it safe to step away though one hand remained on Icarium's shoulder mapo said west of here lies the jag odon Icarium said yes a good direction i admit mapo i feel close this time very close mapo nodded this feels so much like the end of memento to me <laughs> mm -hmm. i wonder if that had any influence on the idea of how mr erickson wrote this because mm -hmm. i think that movie came out around this time period yeah probably did because oh i wonder if he came question to the idea on his own or if memento was an inspiration for it in some way yeah that's a good question and uh man such a great and that is so funny because it's yeah it's john g <laughs> yes <laughs> it's like it's, that's what that's the first that is the first movie i ever saw of christopher nolan i was like oh my good gracious this is amazing this is one of the best movies i've seen in a long time mm, yeah it's still so troubling because of that aspect it's like that son of a gun <laughs> mm. Icarium said it's dawn have you packed up our camp? Mapo said, aye, though I suggest we walk but a short distance today until you're fully recovered. Ikarim said, yes, a wise decision. It was another hour before they were ready to leave, for Ikarim needed to oil his bow and set a whetstone to his sword. Mapo waited patiently, seated on a boulder, until Ikarim finally straightened and turned to him, then nodded. They set off westward. After a time, as they walked on the plain, Ikarim glanced at Mapo. He said, what would I do without you, my friend? The nest of lines framing Mappo's eyes flinched. Then he smiled ruefully as he considered his reply. He said, perish the thought. As it reached into the wasteland known as the Jagodon, the plain stretched before them unbroken. It's sad, yet I have to remind myself that Mappo chose this burden. He could have escaped it by giving a car to the Azath. Yes, he did, and he could. He must have rolled a one. <laughs> a one for what check? I don't know what kind of check that would require. I don't know. You're a DM. I don't know. Maybe he rolled a 20 loyalty check. That could be what it was. It's just he couldn't <laughs> shake. He just can't shake it no matter what. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, uh, dude, that's like a critical thing. But it was, will, will, will he pay, like my poor characters in Darkest Dungeon pay, with their sanity? I'm sorry. I'm not bitter. <laughs> I'm not bitter. <laughs> but uh, I feel very, I don't know how to feel about Mapo. You know, it's like he came to this point to, you know, he came to where he was supposed to be and supposed to do what he was. You know, basically, I feel like he reached the point of the task, but we found out that he was lied to, but he didn't find that out. I think he kind of did. Did he not? Find, he didn't find that out, did he? I don't think so. I don't think he did. That was told to us via other means and when he wasn't around. So I'm just kind of like, wait a minute. So this poor guy doesn't even know that he's been led around like this but he loves Ikarium so much he'll just shoulder the burden yeah and i'm like wow that's that's love i mean it's true love it's just true brother brotherly friend love just great friends mm -hmm. and thus the chapter ends mm. the epilogue goal get through this without getting too emotional yep <laughs> we go to the wiccan plains the young widow, a small clay flask clutched in her hands, left the horsewife's yurt and walked out into the grassland beyond the camp. The sky overhead was empty and, for the woman, lifeless. Her bare feet stepped heavily, toes snagging in the yellowed grasses. Side note here, the fact that the Wiccans have yurts instead of teepees is one of the reasons they look more Mongolian to me than Native American. <laughs> okay. I, I get, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist sticking that South Park Mongolian picture in there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> trying to be serious here, Billy. <laughs> I, I know, I know. I'm, try, I'm trying to help us. I, I couldn't to... remember specifically why I picture them more Mongolian than Native you know, American. It's yurts. But... It's yurts. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. It's the yurts, man. And we've always had this, this. That's not a far distance, though. You know that because the Native Americans are descendants from the Asiatic nomads. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they came across the land bridge, yeah, right? Exactly. So they're they're the same folks for the most part. But I'm like either this. There's something that makes me think of Mongolians. Mm -hmm. When the widow had gone thirty paces, she stopped and lowered herself to her knees. She faced the vast Wiccan plain, her hands resting on her swollen belly, the horsewife's flask smooth, polished and warm beneath the calluses. The searching was complete, the conclusions inescapable. The child within her was 
empty, a thing without a soul. The vision of the horsewife's pale, sweat-beaded face rose to hover before the young woman, her words whispering like the wind. Even a warlock must ride a soul. The children they claimed were no different from children they did not claim. Do you understand? What grows within you possesses nothing. It has been cursed for reasons only the spirits know. The child within you must be returned to the earth. She unstoppered the flask. There would be pain, at least to begin with, then a cooling numbness. No one from the camp would watch, all eyes averted from this time of shame. A storm cloud hung on the north horizon. She had not noticed it before. It swelled, rolled closer, towering in dark. The widow raised the flask to her lips. A hand swept over her shoulder and clamped onto her wrist. The young woman cried out and twisted around to see the horsewife, her breath coming in gasps, her eyes wide as she stared at the storm cloud. The flask fell to the ground. Figures from the camp were now running toward the two women. The widow searched the old woman's weathered face, seeing fear and... Hope? She asked, What? What is it? The horsewife seemed unable to speak. She continued staring northward. The storm cloud darkened the rolling hills. The widow turned and gasped. The cloud was not a cloud. It was a swarm, a seething mass of black, striding like a giant toward them, tendrils spinning off, then coming around again to rejoin the main body. Terror gripped the widow. Pain shot up her arm from where the horsewife still clutched her wrist, a hold that threatened to snap bones. The widow thought, flies, oh spirits below, flies. The swarm grew closer, a flapping, tumbling nightmare. The horsewife screamed in wordless anguish, as if giving voice to a thousand grieving souls. Releasing the widow's wrist, she fell to her knees. The young woman's heart stammered with sudden realization. She thought, no, not flies. Crows. Crows. So many crows. Deep within her, the child stirred. Uh, uh. What a scene. Yeah, absolutely. This is uh, one of my strongest memories from the book. Yeah, I agree. It's one of the biggest core memories from this book. And it's so funny that it's the very last thing in the book. Yes. <laughs> That's what makes it so simply amazing that it's always stuck with me. I can't think of a more amazing post credit scene than this at the end of a season. Oh, yeah. So imagine this is a show, right? And it's like oh, yeah. you do 10 hours <laughs> per book. Yeah. You finish with Ikarim and Mappo, do the credits, and people are like, okay, put this at the end, post credits. Yeah. Oh, my God. Dude. Dude, that's great. The way this is done, he describes this in such a cinematic fashion that I have this entire thing planned out in my head. I see every scene here. It's so yep. vivid to me. Like I said, I've repeated it multiple times. He is one of the most cinematic writers that I've read. I can just see it frame for frame. Like, oh, I just feel it. It's amazing. What I would give to see this on the screen done mm -hmm. correctly. Done correctly. Yes. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> That's the key. That's the key. Again, oh. I'm simply amazed at the magnitude of Coltane's soul in comparison with the immensely powerful Sormo Enath. It's simply incredible. Was Sormo eight or six? I think it was eight. Yeah. And so this is what appears to be thousands, if not tens of thousands. If it's a thundercloud looking thing, yeah, it's that's, tens of that's thousands. yeah, tens or hundreds of thousands. Hundreds. Yeah. Wow. Mm. It would be uncountable yeah. the way I envision it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Absolutely magnificent ending to that book. And thus the book ends. Mm. Incredible. My favorite Malazan book. Fantastic. That's it. It's right now. It's mine. Right now. I mean, tomorrow. Right now. <laughs> tomorrow. It could change. It could be memories of mine. <laughs> Dude, like I said, I have such a hard time separating because thanks to you, you turn me onto it after it's done. And it's such a beautiful thing. It's done. It was over. So I have a hard time sometimes separating my memories from what is one and what is the other. It's just like, oh, yeah, that's right. You know, it's like because it's just going to keep going. I'm going to turn around and start right away on Memories of Eyes. And we're going to start. We'll be back in two weeks or so working on Memories of Eyes. Yeah. <laughs> I have an easier time keeping the first five or six books together, but it's really the last three yeah. that I get mixed up uh, what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Because it, it does feel at that point that everything is coming together overall and so you start to get an idea of okay we're one contiguous story moving yes. forward instead of kind of splitting things here and there yes because he does it within a book where you got a bunch of smaller storylines combining and at the end of the book well it's also going on throughout the series where groups are splitting up and then it's all combining yeah yeah all of a sudden it just meets up it's like wait a yeah. minute These, all of a sudden the stories all meet up for standout moments 
the horrified reaction of Leoman's scouts upon returning from Aaron Way. I was really surprised to see how they reacted, but it also told yeah. me a lot about their mentality. Yeah, wholly unexpected reaction from my side. I was expecting them to be as bloodthirsty as Corbeau You yes. know, like, all right, all right, right let's see. <laughs> mm -hmm. and especially after we saw those roving bandits, bloodthirsty yeah. taking yes. a situation, you almost expect everybody to be like that. Yes, absolutely. Shaik taking command of Corbolo's army. It was a good cowing of his ego. Oh, and I like that a lot. And this is maybe an odd question I'm going to ask. Is this the end of Felicity and the beginning of the goddess, or is it more of an amalgam of the two? I'm kind of leaning toward the latter, the amalgam of the two. I think so. Way, I think it's both. Okay, because okay, the way that she stepped forward, but you know, she does think about sister. But when she says sister, I don't think of Felicity. I'm thinking it's all straight goddess. <laughs> No, listen you know. still in there yeah oh i know she's still in there but is she kind of in the back just like is she like that the i'm sorry i'm gonna have to do in reference you know what i'm talking about the, the the pearl of consciousness that's that's basically lido inside of all the sandworms is, she, is it like that <laughs> <Are> you, <laughs> <laughs> have you ever seen dean john malkovich no oh my word dude that's a perfect example it's i don't <laughs> You have to see that movie, dude. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Do you know what it is? Have you ever heard of it? Have I ever you mentioned about it before. It? Oh, my yeah. word. Because basically, they're. I'm sorry, people. This is a 1999 movie. I, I'm spoiling it. I don't care what you think. Basically, we're making vessels for these groups of people to travel forward into, into time, you know, to grow for older inside these human vessels. And Malkovich is the newest vessel. And later on, a baby's born at the very end, and it, it has Cusack banished in there, but he'll have no control. He'll be stuck in the out, this kind of watching from the outside, stuck inside watching this child live. It's like, oh, dude, it's very much, it's, it's Dune. <laughs> mm, okay. I enjoyed Gessler and company showing up and then pissing off Blistig almost immediately. <laughs> now, these fellows are some of my fave in the series, beside, aside from the Bridge Burners, but too much of them could rub you wrong. <laughs> but at the same time, I don't know. It's like we've not been exposed to them too much. It's like I've, I, they're always, they're always hilarious, but they show up just in time to come kind of save the day in a little bit of weird way, mm -hmm. <laughs> or, you know, whether it's just emotionally or physically. The sweet innocence of truth trying to save the dogs and Mappo's kind gesture in giving them the healing elixirs. It was very yeah, touching. As you, yeah. As you would see, it gets you right in the feels. <laughs> yep. Finally, finding out why Puss was trying to eliminate all those spiders throughout the book. Oh, Oh, dude, that makes me give a little bit more respect for Pust all the way around because it's like he's not as crazy as he seems, but my <laughs> word, it must be tiring to act that crazy. <laughs> you remember when he was sweeping Fiddler's face with the broom? Yes. Oh, my good gracious. <laughs> That's when we were first really introduced to him. You're like, oh, my good gracious, this yeah. guy's too much. Yeah. He's too much. And what a perfect match of him and Magora. Oh, it's a match made like Kubrick and Tarantino and Fulci kind of perfect match it's mm. <laughs> very weird and odd and off-putting and dangerous <laughs> yeah finding out what the nameless marine wrote on that piece of cloth that that hit me pretty hard yeah you know what that gets me really that almost gets me a little misty and the fact that erickson gives us this name really may it, it, it makes it mean something it makes that marine so much more important when you go back on it you know mm-hmm Mappo's choice not to tell Ikarium about any of their experiences from this entire book. Yeah. And I just completely forgot that. It's just like, uh, yeah, I just, wow. I, I kind of got nothing other than this. I just completely forgot that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Basically a whole year of your life. Just gone. Yeah. Just gone. <laughs> he doesn't seem too burdened by this fact, you know, neither one. Well, he's been doing it for a while, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Quite a while. It does feel like something's a little bit different this time though. I don't think it's ever gotten this far with them. Yeah. I agree. And then finally, the entire epilogue. Such a core memory for me. It was hard for me to keep it together reading through it. Yeah, I could tell. It hits me in all the right areas. It gives you hope for the future yeah. in some ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. And I agree with everything you just said, brother. Preach it. Preach it. <laughs> all right, Billy. Great job tonight. Hey, fantastic job, brother.
You got any final thoughts before we drop off here? I do. This thanks everyone for making it to the end with us. I cannot wait as we get ready to get into Memories of Ice again. And I'm sure I'll be saying this or something similar. You ain't seen nothing yet, man. It just keeps, you know, Eric is the master of, yeah, he's the master of escalation and it's just wild. But dude, what a dude. Thank you for making Deadhouse Gates, Comrade. One of the just such so amazing this time through. Fantastic, man. Yes, thanks for going through with me. Hey, I'm beautiful. And then for a planning perspective, next week we will be recapping all of our favorite moments from the book. Since it's been yes. a year, we're going to need to remind ourselves. We probably forgot about half of them, so it'll be yes. good to go back through those. And then the following week, we'll kick off Memories of Ice. Yes, cannot wait. Thanks, everybody. We appreciate you listening, and we'll see you next week. Yes, we'll see you all next week, everybody. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us, and we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.